All right, we are back in the classroom for another session of Cannon's class, and I am honored uh, to be here today with a, a true scholar on so many levels, a uh, professor at Hampton University, but also the author of the book in which we're discussing today, uh, The Slave Ship Clotilda uh, and the Making of Africa Town. Uh, as, as detailed as, and, and complex as that sounds, we're going to break it down with the one and only Dr. Natalie S. Robertson. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm smiling. That's all that matters, right? I see you smiling, too. So. A- absolutely. <laughs> I'm in great company, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me for oh. this session of Canon's Classroom. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting because and and I'm I feel like this is going to be not only an important uh session but more just it's it's broadening the the aspect of one we get to discuss your amazing book that you you put forth along with some other books that that correlate uh but then at the same time we're we're spreading knowledge and information in a very simplistic form that obviously a scholar on your level an academic on your level gets to to uh, have discourse and, and converse with so many uh, in that academic field, but to actually sit down and we get to break it down with the, the hip hop community uh, and, and how we can apply some of the things that are going on in the generation today and that's those same energies that have been going on in our DNA uh, since the beginning all the way back to you know the, the ideas of Africa Town and, and even touching on the aspects of you've done so much first-hand research to actually even taking the trip to uh, Africa and, and even understanding where everyone came from for the, for the Middle Passage and, and, and actually did the, the research to, to the, the actual points where all of this started, all of this generated. So I would love to get into that as we tap in. But if, if you could just kind of give us, I, we usually start off with framing questions, but I would say if you just give us some framework of, uh, one, a little bit about the book, but then even uh, what this journey actually was, as well as, you know, the making of Africa, Africa Town. And I would even start like for the people who don't know what is Africa Town and, and is it still in existence today? And how did that all come about? Sure. Well, the book traces the anatomy, if you will, um, of the smuggling venture of the slave ship Clotilda which was actually a federal crime. Wow. These Africans were smuggled into the United States on the eve of the Civil War right. in violation of the Piracy Act of 1820, which made smuggling Africans into the country illegal, illegal. Right. and punishable by death, by hanging. Wow. So, so the the punishment for smuggling a slave from the uh, Piracy Act of 1820 was actually hanging. Yes, death by hanging. Wow. And did that so? And did that occur? Did that actually occur a lot, or did that actually happen, or was that one of those laws where they put it there, but it wasn't really? Well, they put it there, but you know. Collusion, we've heard a lot about that word lately. <laughs> right. Collusion between smugglers, a consular agents, and judges really undermined the implementation and the enforcement of anti smuggling laws. Right. If I could sort of back up just a minute to talk about one aspect of the U.S. Constitution, which was one of three pro-slavery concessions that slave-owning congressmen uh, made to their slave-owning constituents, constituents. <laughs> in the form of Article One, Section 9, right. which says that the migration or importation um, as any of the states of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808, but a tax or a duty may be placed upon each importation right. not to exceed $10 per person. Wow. So <clears throat> Article 1, Section 9 essentially gives 
uh, smugglers license to import Africans into the country up to 1808. Right. The problem develops when 1808 arrives. The smugglers don't honor it. They just keep going. They keep going because they see Article 1, Section 9 as a gift that the slave-owning congressman made to them. Right, right. The other problem is that the federal government did not impose or place any penalties in the law for violators. Right. Therefore, smuggling continued until the federal government implemented the Piracy Act of 1820. It was death by hanging. Absolutely. Now, even when the Piracy Act was implemented, Americans continued to smuggle Africans into the country. Right. Because, of course, in 1820 and certainly by 1830, cotton becomes king. Right. That then increases the demand for Africans. Right. And smugglers endeavor to meet that demand, even in violation of federal law. So, um, you know, due to the collusion and bribery and quid pro quo relationships between smugglers and judges and consular yeah. agents stationed at various ports throughout the world, smugglers were able to smuggle with impunity. Yeah. Um, with the exception of Nathaniel Gordon, okay. whose ship Erie was overhauled by federal authorities at sea in 1860. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, he was carrying 897 slaves aboard his wow. ship at that particular time. Wow. The federal authorities overhauled that ship, removed the slaves from the vessel, sent Nathaniel Gordon back to New York for adjudication. Uh -huh. While awaiting trial, he attempted to commit suicide. Wow. Because Nathaniel Gordon did not want the dubious distinction of going down in history that. as the only white man who was hanged for smuggling niggers into the country. Uh, right. Now, that's not my word. That, okay? hey, hey, I did not create that word, <laughs> but that's a word understood. that they used every day, all day. Right. And in fact, the slave trade was called nigger business. Nigger business. Uh, uh. Every day, all day. So he did not want that dubious distinction because in his he mind, would be the he only was asking, one. why me? Why me? After 40 years, you right. know, of having the Piracy Act implemented, why me? You know, so, and they've caught a lot of smugglers. And he was the only one. But due to those collusions, they were able to get away. He was the only one. Now, he botched the suicide attempt and ultimately they hanged him in 1862. Wow, but so he was the only one? That, yeah. So he's the, where, only, he's yes. the, the, the lone white man <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to actually have been hanged yes. uh, for, <laughs> for smuggling slaves. Now, yeah, but that, were it not for that, right. um, his ship, Erie, would have been the last American slave ship instead of the Clotilda. Wow. So interestingly enough, and just so I can break it down, I always try to, you know, kind of to to bring it back to a space where the audience can embrace it. The idea of slave smuggling is almost kind of paved the way or even, you know, with having the involvement of the system and the government of the drug trade uh, and how a lot of these laws are loosely based even to enslave us once again to where we're not the ones bringing the drugs and the the guns into our communities, but we get the strongest penalties when caught with the drugs or caught, you know, trying to provide for our own community by selling the drugs. Absolutely. Uh, and the penalties and the, and the punishments for actually, whether it's crack cocaine or even over the year, years when you think of the, the war on drugs, heroin, all of these things, were almost to a point where they could enslave our, our brothers and sisters in the way of, you know, giving them, uh, as I call them, football number sentences uh, that are beyond uh, reasonable. But then at the same time, when you figure out how these drugs get into the country and how these weapons get into the country, ultimately are because of the government and it benefits the government. So when you sp speak on uh, what was going on in the Constitution before the Piracy Act, uh, 
our congressmen who were slave owners and that that's not a secret and you know the majority of their constituents were slave owners as well they kind of set it up to where it's like we're gonna say we know this is bad but we're gonna set it up to where you know you won't be punished for it but ultimately this is the thing you know like you said cotton is king this is this this is what built our country so we got to allow it to happen but sure. at some point we have to sure. put some type of penalties on it so i feel like there's a coalition um between obviously the slave trade and what goes on even to this day with you know drugs and and how you know the the people on the the lowest on the totem pole right are are being punished at extreme levels yes to re-enslave them so actually there are a lot of parallels between um the slave trade and the drug trade because in both cases um you're talking about illegal uh products being smuggled right. into the country right in both cases, in order for that to be effective and in order for it to be lucrative, you have to have the cooperation and the collusion of law enforcement right. who would be willing to, you know, basically turn a blind eye and look the other way right. in order for smugglers to be successful. Right. Um, in the case of the drug trade also, you are correct when you say that the people who are being arrested the most are actually the street level right. dealers. It's not the people who have the means and the wherewithal <laughs> and the transportation yeah. to actually import the drugs into the country. Because, you know, the, the, there is also a racial hierarchy Absolutely. in crime and criminality. Oh, uh, you gotta say that right? again. <laughs> There's a racial hierarchy in crime and cr criminality so that the higher you know you move up um, on the totem pole per se, right? And the more money people have, the more connections they have, right? And the more ability they have, and they could to pay those lawyers bribe, and the systems yes, and the to judges. to lawyer up, a <laughs> absolutely, um, to actually sort of pay their way um, out of trouble. Whereas the average street level pusher does not have. Yeah, they gotta um, they gotta use means. the public defender. Well, yeah, they have to use the public <laughs> defender who's gonna get paid whether they win your case or not. So that's absolutely. why public defenders are not good for you. Right. Um, but also, um, you know, when you think about street level pushers, they, they are also pawns in a larger chess game. Right. Which takes us back to this. <clears throat> when you're able to arrest street level pushers, then you're able to sort of justify. You're cleaning up the you streets. Know, absolutely. <laughs> you're able to, you know, justify your, your war on drugs. You're able to, you know, sell that to the public to ask a wage like the conscience of the public that something is happening. Right. When, in fact, <clears throat> the street level pusher is the end of the process. Right. Not the beginning of the process. Right. And it goes back to what you were saying uh, before and in, in discussing in the book is the idea of it's not just uh, it's it's not like the, the ending uh, of it. But ultimately, when you step in and understand what the system is and what the, the slave trade actually did, even in that idea of like, okay, we know it's wrong. And, you know, on the eve of, uh, of the civil war, it was still like, we're still, we're, it's, slavery isn't abolished. It's just, you know, reorganized. It's in reorganized and it's transformed. Right. And, you know, with, in the larger context of setting up the system of slavery, you know, for capital gain and for exploitation, then transforming it, you know, when it comes to implementing uh, mass incarceration, there is one constant that remains in both situations. And that constant is the use of the black body wow. and the use of black people as commodities right. upon which to build wealth. Right. And that's and to build this country even more so. And, and the fact that, you know, the Jedi mind trick is to, to, to use them, but let them know to make them feel useless. And in that sense of, 
we know your labor, your efforts built the country, but we're not even going to treat you as actual citizens. And then for generations, we're always going to make you seem like you are at the bottom of the totem pole when ultimately we couldn't have done it without you. Well, it, yes, and, th and that is the way that capitalism works ultimately because in order for the very few to maintain the control elite. over the masses... <laughs> largely so that the elite and the very few can live a life of luxury, then they have to implement systems of control right. over and against the masses so that the masses actually produce the leisure and the wealth right. for the elite to enjoy a higher level of living. Right. So let's, let's, Let's talk fantasy for a second. Okay. <laughs> As, and I, I know you discussed this and, and have studied this, but just I've always wanted to to kind of lay this groundwork. And, and we talk about everything from reparations and, and 40 acres and a mule. Uh, you know, in a fantasy world, if if we were to receive those reparations or, or the idea of if it was more of an even playing field uh, once you know, slavery was so-called abolished and, you know, we were paid what we were uh, more, not just what we were worth, but paid for all of the work that, that Africans had done for this country. At what level today do you feel like, one, what number would that equate to? I've heard that, you know, 40 acres and a mule would then have now translated into trillions of dollars, which would then, you know, every... African American or anyone that had the connection would somewhere have the ability. I, I, I think the number was roughly like somewhere one hundred and forty thousand dollars for every African American uh, in America. Uh, however, that math breaks out. I'm definitely not a mathematician, but I just know that idea of if we were to get on that even playing field, and you know, take the 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 capitalistic structure that's already here, where the elite are ruling the the lower class if we got what we were supposed to get how would this world look today and how uh and how would that have applied uh in those concepts because knowing what africa town was and all these places this this is what we were striving for to obtain but clearly we never got it right well i'm glad you raised that question because the last chapter of the book is entitled crossroads now that you know, we've gone through the history of this case and we get to the end of the narrative, what happens, you know, on the crossroads? Right. Do we pursue reparations as a people or is it more valid um, and more efficient for us to engage in community building like they I did want the in reparations. Okay. I want my money. I mean, <laughs> well, well, I, I understand, but I, I well, and, and that goes back to the capitalism in it yes. because I don't feel that we could build the community unless right. we have something to build the community. And I with. agree, and I actually think we should pursue both because right. first of all, there are no people who have been aggrieved who would say to you, all right, I've been aggrieved, but I don't want anything, <laughs> right, you know, right. which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Right. Um, but if you're going to pursue reparations, you have to decide upon which level you're going to pursue it. Right. And I actually discussed that in the book because right. it's actually possible um, for you to pursue reparations at the individual level. Really? In other words... Talk you, on that. You, you, you can get your words, reparations you, you, by you, yourself. <laughs> well, you, you actually go after individuals who are um, members of families wow. who profited on the backs of your enslaved ancestors. Interesting. So if, if you can do the research of your own genealogy and your own family... And you can find out how you or your family was enslaved and who enslaved them. You can go after that family that enslaved you. And family. that information is available um, if you want to put in the work, as they yeah. say, hey, to find that information. They should. It's free money. You, yes. <laughs> they you, were, was money that your family <laughs> earned. You can begin with what's called slave schedules. And slave um, schedules. most states have slave schedules. That information would tell you who the property owners were, 
um, how many slaves they owned, wow. and quite possibly what their names and ages were. So that information is available. You might have to do a bit of digging for it. But and that's it what the available. internet is for. You online right now, you can be typing as we speak. Absolutely. So you can pursue reparations on the individual level. And the, you, are there any cases that, that, I mean, that you know of that, you know, someone did the work and got to the family and actually received, you know, payment or reparations in that in that form? N- not not that I know of personally, but right. I, I wouldn't say that it hasn't happened. Right. But it certainly can happen for a lot of people if they want to pursue reparations on that level. Hey, and instead then, of playing video games and downloading music, go get your money. Absolutely. <laughs> um, then you can pursue reparations also at the municipal level because right. we have evidence that cities collected taxes wow. on slaves, like the tax uh, assessor would come to your house and say, okay, Mr. So-and-so and so, you know, you have a house, I see you have a horse and buggy, and oh, by the way, you have like 20 Negroes. Right. So we're going to levy taxes against your Negroes because wow. they are your property. Wow. And that tax revenue would go back into the coffers of the municipality, whatever the case may be. Taxes on black folks. Absolutely. Then you can pursue it at the state level that also collected uh, tax revenue on importations. And you See, can that's why Wesley it. Snipes didn't want to pay taxes because <laughs> he felt like they had been taxing him for so long. <laughs> you can pursue it at the federal government yeah. level as well. Now, that's been that's a probably, tougher nut to crack. Oh, yeah, I was going to say that one's probably you know, a little because, more difficult. Because you actually, oh, in any of the cases, you have to produce the evidence that you've been aggrieved. It's not enough to walk in a court of law and say, I'm a descendant of a slave. Now you have you know, to go. You owe me. Right. What is the basis for your claim and where is the evidence of what you are And it can start claiming? with understanding your story, your book, uh, as well as you know how that correlates with Barracoon. And then I feel like these are great entry points into this world to then you can go and find out about your own family and, and do that research. But, Absolutely. But what we know about the federal government is that the federal government actually made mortgages to people who wanted to acquire slaves wow. um, through, uh, individual, through individual banks, uh, United States banks um, that were set up in various states. Wow. So you could go to individual banks. So you can banks. get slaves on credit. You could get slaves on credit. <laughs> <It's pretty much. laughs> I, I, absolutely. You could get slaves on credit. You could walk into a bank and you could ask for you know, a loan um, or mortgage to purchase slaves. And they would see that as a good purchase because at that time, black people were property and the property was very valuable and and slavery was a lucrative enterprise. It was an investment. It, It was an investment. And then the slaves could also be utilized as collateral. Uh, African American Express. To get additional (laughs) loans from the banks. And ultimately, if you missed your note, they would come and repossess. And repo your your slaves. They're going to put a boot on your slaves. You can't use them no more. (laughs) In the tradition. That's crazy. in, In the tradition that is still extant in other words this is still a practice today once they repossess your property they would then resell it you know um, oh. at the highest price to bidders on the court Foreclosure. on the courthouse steps wow that I mean, that, didn't let that sink in for a minute, just to understand that truly when you when we talk about the property mentality that uh, we have as or that we've been brainwashed with uh, but for it to go all the way back to where it was truly a banking system that was built on it, a, a, an insurance system that was built on it, all the way through to the federal government, that to this day that there are taxes that were paid into the government on us. Absolutely. And rather than seeing, you know, the North and the South um, in dichotomous terms, you right. know, because people like to sort of define... Um, uh, slavery as a rift, if you will, or the Civil War as a rift between the North North and the the South. South. Right. They were basically 
inextricably linked to one another. Right. Um, because the Southerners needed money, and you know many of the bankers were in the northern states. Right. And so and because they the northern developed... states had the more money and had the more power over the government initially, even though the South was larger in span well yes and they developed a symbiotic relationship between one another right so you know you could loan money to people in the south who then had plantations who produced cotton right who sold cotton you know for profit and then was able to take some of those proceeds and pay the bankers back so they had to work together interest. right right yes so the north needed the south and the south needed the north absolutely i mean and, and to that idea just in setting the table once again i would love to know because I, I i heard you use the the ten dollar number um if you could break that down a little bit more and based off of like how much during this time was the average slave worth well it depends upon what year so, oh, okay. in which we are oh because we're discussing more like 1860 or well, this is 1860, certainly from 1820 coming forward, the right. prices for slaves increase in tandem with the perceived risks of importing them into the country. So the, so the more dangerous it was and for the smugglers, it made this just like drugs. A absolutely. At, you know, or at the very least, you could justify your price yeah, yeah, yeah. based upon the perceived risks associated with, you know, going and right. violating laws in order so, to acquire so those African So slaves got more expensive the closer it was to the Civil War and turning things over. That's one factor in the equation. The other factors that will influence price would be your particular skill set, perhaps. Size. Um, size, gender. Um, whether you are a male, for example, who is young, averaging about 19 years of age, right. which if you read the literature on the slave trade, black males averaging about 19 years of age were considered to be the prime number one Negro. Wow. Because they had a long life expectancy. And typically males coming out of Africa also have additional skills like carving skills and smelting right. skills and so on and so forth. And all of that gets commodified wow. and factored into the price. Wow. Right? So... um those would be some of the factors that might influence the price of a slave. Right. If you are female, what might influence your price is whether or not your virginity is intact. Really? Because you have male buyers who are seeking first access sexually wow. to female slaves. So if you could so ultimately to be sex market, slaves. Yes, if you could market that female slave as one who has her virginity intact, and of course they could check that. Wow. Um, and they did, you know, undergo these kinds of um, inspections, which ultimately ended up being a kind of pornographic scene Absolutely. for a lot of those Africans. Then you could command a higher price. For her. And these are the smugglers who set the price? The smugglers set the price. Um, the demand sets the price as well. Um, but there may be ultimately some negotiation, you know, um, somewhere down the line. I mean, on the auction block, of course, um, what influences the prices is, is the number of bidders who are competing against and, you and so what for, was that, for those Africans. What was that $10 number? That ten dollar number was the um, the limit of the amount of money that you could tax an importation coming into the country, and this is where the federal government is culpable as well. Okay, uh, implementing that particular um, aspect into Article One, Section Nine, where it says, "But a tax or a duty may be placed upon each importation." not to exceed $10 per person. Okay. What it's saying actually is that if you decide to import such persons, and that's the language of right. 
uh, Article 1, Section 9, but the language is left open for others to interpret as they need to do. Right. So when you say such persons, that could be Africans, that could be anyone right. in, in, in that definition. When you say um, any such persons you are importing into the country, you can tax um, and place a duty or tax on their heads not to exceed $10 per person. What you're actually saying is it's okay to levy a tax against them okay. and to retain that tax revenue for your coffers. Right. And so at the end of the day, and I, I, you touched on it as, as well when you're talking about articles uh, in the Constitution uh, of this being a federal crime of, of slave smuggling. And that's uh, obviously what the this book deals with and even Barracoon deals with uh, from Zora Neale Hurston. The... The fact that it it was clearly a crime, but no one was really punished for this crime. And even to this day, these these crimes were committed that built this country. So to be able to to know that the government was well within it and the same thing where the government is well within the prison systems and the industrial prison complex and all these things that are currently going on. Nothing has really changed. Is that is not changed. <laughs> um, it's still a system of exploitation uh, in which black people are the primary targets of that exploitation in this country. And as I was doing my research, I discovered a disturbing parallel between the average age and the gender of what was considered to be the prime number one Negro um, that was the target for the slave trade, which was the black male. Right. Uh, and the prime number one target for the prison system, which happens to also be the black, black male, male, averaging about 19, 19 years, years of old. age. Wow. So in that regard, nothing has changed. Wow. But what has remained constant is that these are both systems of exploitation that thrive on the misery and the backs of enslaved and incarcerated black people wow and and so just to speaking of your research and you know uh your book as well how one how did you even think about wanting to to take this journey and, and to dig as deep as you have and then explain a little bit what like the trip to africa and what you discovered and what you found to you know put this amazing book together well actually um my professor alan f roberts dr alan f roberts who um was one of my professors at the university of iowa suggested this topic to me uh, for my doctoral dissertation okay i did a feasibility study initially and determined that there was enough material there uh to investigate you know um, to the level of actually writing a dissertation. And it actually uh, morphed into a 15-year research odyssey um, that took me back and forth to Mobile several times and wow. to three African slave ports wow. in search of the answers to the questions regarding the origins of these Africans because I knew that that would be uh, the most important question that, people would want answered right. uh, through this research. The issue was, though, by the time that I graduated with my Ph.D. from the University of Iowa, I had not yet solved those origins. Right. So I applied for a National Endowment for the Humanities um, Research Fellowship. I received that fellowship, which then allowed me to go back to Africa, wow. um, to southwestern and central Nigeria in particular, to um, uncover the origins um, of these Africans based upon the research that I had done on this side of the Atlantic. Got it. So um, that really added another 10 years to this project. <laughs> I could imagine. You know, because, um, first of all, origins are not easy to solve, um, and it really depends upon what information you have available to you Right. Um, that makes that all possible. So um, I, as a part of my journey, I came to Howard University to the Moreland Spingarn Collection 
to review the Hurston papers, right. which is where I collected some ethnographic material about Cujo because um, as many of you know that um, Hurston was a trailblazer right. in many regards. Um, she collected just for, a lot of material from him and right. others, and she actually went places that others fear tread. Right, you know? and that's, speak, that, that's in uh, Barracoon where, you know, Zora Neale Hurston actually had the opportunity to sit with Cujo Lewis, uh, who was once enslaved and, as we could say, the, the last black cargo. Yes. And, and having the ability, as, as we know, from their eyes of watching God and any more things in the Harlem Renaissance that Hurston was just a trailblazer in that sense. But to be able, even that process and her actually even being at Howard University and, and being able to, to kind of become who she ultimately it has, has we all revere. Uh, but also that process was challenging as a black woman and, and going through all of that. Yes, well, it was Hurston who said that the average Negro is morbid. In right. other words, the average Negro is dead. Wow. So if you really want to understand something about black culture, right, the essence of true black culture, you've got to go places that others fear tread, per wow. se. That's Which powerful. means you've got to go to the backwoods of Alabama. You've yeah. got to go to the juke joints. Yeah. You know, that would be our in the contemporary sense, you know, the, the club, strip club, the strip you got to go to the strip club. <laughs> you got to, you got to go if where you, we if at. You, <laughs> if you, if you really want to know something about the perspective of the yeah. stripper, you know, or the perspective yeah. of the people who patronize yeah. the strip clubs, you got you to gotta go, go there. So she was one of those people. And speak how they speak, even I, within her dialect and absolutely. all those things. And you see that in Barracoon. You see that in, you know, their eyes are watching God. You yes. see that in that sense of where she's speaking on a level to and wanted to be pure in that. And and it goes it goes back to that statement you made or that she made is like the average Negro is morbid or the average Negro is dead. That's such a strong uh, statement even for today because it talks about you know we're we're more than just average but we have to we it has to be pulled out of us it has to be discovered it has to be laid out because they want you to believe that you're nothing but average or below uh, yes and she also said you know research is 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 poking and prying with a purpose wow so I love i've that. been poking and prying <laughs> into this story for 15 years and what's the purpose yes and the purpose <laughs> is to not simply to tell this story but actually to give the descendants of these africans um, greater insight into their own ancestry. So um, I had a lot of aspects to my research agenda, but that was one of the m more important aspects. So Zora Neale Hurston, you know, dust tracks on the road. She right. was burning up the back roads, right. going out, going to places where others didn't want to go. Um, for whatever reason, right. good, bad, or indifferent, and collecting all of this ethnographic material that laid the foundation for scholars like me and many others yes. who've been able to benefit from all of her hard work. Absolutely. And so, you know, we are thrilled that she was able to interview Cujo on a couple of occasions and take all of that information, collect it, and then have that serve as, you know, a foundation for the research that I carried to the next level. Right. Um, because, you know, to this day, uh, no one has really developed this story in the comprehensive way that I have. But I've been able to First do hand. it. I've been able to do it largely with the help of Zora Neale Hurston. She 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 blazed the trail. She blazed the trail and you, for and for you people paved like the way <laughs> to follow. Hey, absolutely. Yeah. And and I definitely want to you know I you know let the audience know how they can uh, purchase this book and and whatever information they can follow up with you whether it's websites social media, uh, but even. As we wrap it up, I still there's a few things just for clarity for myself that I wanted to 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 lay the groundwork on. Uh, one, I, I stated this early when we first started talking, but even just so everyone understands, what is Africa Town and how does how is that related into Mobile, Alabama, and how does that all play into? Because a lot of people, I've I've heard the term, you know, even before I, I read the the. The book it was just more I thought it was something that I feel like oh right after slavery 
uh, you know, people got together and created Africa Town. And I know it's a little bit more complex than that. And then how it correlates with, you know, the this book and, you know, every, and everything that you've been researching. Well, when those Africans were um, disembarked in Mobile, Alabama, they were pretty much left to fend for themselves. You know, they were enslaved for a short period of time until 1863 when the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was issued. Um, and having no means to return to Africa, they propositioned the smuggler to allow them to purchase some land upon which to build their own community. Wow. And this is how Africatown emerged. But Africatown is really a microcosm for, you know, all of the African traditions, folk traditions, folk ways, folk practices, folk ideas that they transferred from Africa. Right. That they actually applied to their situation in the Americas and that actually allowed them to overcome their victimization. Right. Right. So... Um, there actually are several African towns in the history of British North America, okay. now known as the United States. Right. Because wherever African people went, they took their religion with them. They took their philosophies with them, their worldviews with them, their you know, culinary traditions with them. Right. And they applied them to their situations in which they found themselves. And that allowed them to actually overcome their victimization. So the major lesson that I would like people to take away from the book is that, you know, while slavery is one aspect of our experience in um, the Americas, it is not the only aspect Absolutely. of our experience. I say that it is all the not time. even the greatest aspect of our experience. The greatest aspect of our experience as enslaved people is the extent to which we were able to apply our genius to our situation see, to overcome our victimization, see now, which is why we can have this conversation. That's right what now. I think Kanye West was trying to say. He just didn't have, have your eloquence. Yeah. <laughs> yes. he, he, just, he, and, he needed you in that moment when he said slavery was a choice. And he needs some books. <laughs> that, he needs this book. <laughs> he needs a because ultimately that's when you just touched on that to show that our genius in dealing with uh the opposition with dealing with adversity as an african people the power the strength within us uh and for us not to be defined by slavery uh is ultimately the lesson that should be uh, learned and even you talk about uh, the final chapter being the crossroads my thing and even as i'm aware of things that are going on uh currently in our government today and and something is uh as that's sitting there as a parent, as I believe it's the H.R. 1242 African-American uh, History Commission Act that uh, touches on the ability. And I, I've kind of on my own been researching things like that with dealing with reparations and knowing that we're coming up on. Uh, is it the 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 dawn of 500 years of slavery? 400. Or, uh, 400. Yep. I'm sorry. Yep. 400 in 2020. And that idea of like. There's not only there's money available for us to tell our stories and tell our history, but to take our history and, for lack of a better word, plead our case as a community to say, these are the things, now, now that we know this, now that we've done the research, now that scholars like yourself have paved the way, what now? What do we do going forward? How can we use the system that we're currently attached to to benefit our communities? Well, we are now coming up on 2019. So we are about to celebrate in Virginia the arrival of the first African captives to British North America via Fort Monroe. Right. I am also now working with the Tucker family. William Tucker was the first African child to be born in wow. British North America. And I think that it is quite reciprocal. You know, reciprocity is right. at work here because I've had the, you know, the, the honor of writing the story of the last Africans to be imported into the country. Right. And now I have the honor 
of writing the history and collaborating with descendants of the first, first Africans wow. who um, were, born. were yeah. uh, brought into this country as captives. So um, to answer your question, I think that, you know, we are at a crossroads in our history as a people in this country. I think that we should pursue reparations, whether yes. we get reparations or not. Is I know I matter. am. I'm about to go. But the, but, the slave but schedule. We, I'm gonna we, be looking we, at the slave schedule. We we need to pursue it because again, um, there are no people that I know of who have been aggrieved and who have said we don't want any recompense. Right. Um, after being aggrieved, but I also think that it is worthy for us to get back to the point of community building in the tradition of Cujo, the Clotilda Africans, and the other Africans, our other ancestors, who apply their skills and their talent and their genius to uplifting themselves through community building. That is the spirit of our ancestors, yes. and that is the spirit that is within us that we need to cultivate right now. Wow, strong words. That That is the, the best way to end it, in my opinion, to just really, you've enlightened us with your book, uh, and then even sitting here today, just framing it up in such a way that it, I, I feel like, like you said, it's about community, it's about community building, and and having the, the wherewithal and the understanding to, apply that for this generation and generations to come. So I thank you so much. Thank uh, you very much. And then I would say if one would want to get this book, obviously we're going to put it at the bottom of the screen or, sure. or want to be in contact with you. What would be the best way to go about that? Well, you, the book is at um, Prager, uh, also called ABC Clio. You can order it through Barnes and Noble as well. It's also available on Amazon. And if anyone would like to contact me, you can reach out to me at Natalie, N-A-T-A-L-I-E, right. dot Robertson, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-O-N, at HamptonU.edu. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dak. Excuse me. Thank you so much, Dr. Natalie S. Robertson. Uh, this has been a true honor, and uh, I thank you for enlightening us, and I thank you for your great work as well. Likewise. Thank you, Mr. Uh -huh. Ken. A pleasure. <laughs>